OK, so just as a little bit of an introduction here, um, I got roped into this by Dennis. He wanted <laughs> some help. And uh, based on um, based on what we didn't discover or did discover, depending upon the viewpoint, uh, he probably needed it because uh, the first thing I discovered is that there's a whole bunch of bureaucratic um, nonsense that you have to wade through to find out anything. Particularly if you're dealing with government agencies or contractors of a government agency. Definitely. So I'm not going to talk about this too much. I, um, I did run into problems with the Stanford and Dennis ran into a you know bureaucratic obfuscation, but I when I went to the CBAF, which is located here in Newport News at Jefferson Labs, I ran into the same thing, and that is you go to their website and you can't find anything that you want to know. <laughs> if you have, if you want to know something, you can't find it by going to the website. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> How did you ever locate the material that you located? I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it was, I learned over the years, I've acquired this skill of um, poking around in different places and trying to, and using just poking around and finding stuff. And, and then um, it, it it's sort of like working the problem backwards. It's not like going to the to the beginning and saying, I want you to give me information about X. If you do that on the internet or any of these places, you don't get what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I guess I we're ready that, to go. Uh, I found that, uh, I, I don't know what the situation is recently, but that in many of the government sponsored labs, one can download the raw data and do your own analysis of it. Um, sometimes you have to write your own software to do that. Um, and uh, I don't know whether they've locked up some of this day data now or whether you still can download the data because uh, oftentimes the theories of the investigators are irrelevant. And what you wanna do is to look at the raw data to test some other hypothesis that they did not test. Well, you first have to know where the data is. That was the problem that, uh, that we ran into. You have to, anyway. Okay, you ready to go, Dennis? Yeah. Gary Ricker will be presenting on uh, linear accelerators. Okay, um, I've titled this Smashing Atoms with Relativity. <laughs> In the old days, you know, you used to be, uh, I remember that was atom smashers. Anybody, I'm sure you all probably remember that term, atom smashers. And relativity has to do with uh, what is relativity actually needed or involved in this? And Dennis approached me and um, he is interested in um, solving the question uh, using neomechanics. So my interest was, um, is relativistic mass increase uh, something that is involved in the operation of, uh, of the Stanford Linear Accelerator, um, which is abbreviated SLAC. Now, that stands for Stanford Linear Accelerator, Accelerator Center. And it turns out that if you search on that, you don't find out much about the linear accelerator, which was what I discovered immediately. Um, and Dennis apparently was unable to contact anybody at uh, SLAC. And then he contacted um, you know, their contact uh, email address and that person responded by telling him basically go to a bunch of different search engines <laughs> which wasn't really very helpful 
So uh, I want to point out here that David DeHilster um, basically sort of prompted this because he's been saying for many, many years and said and documented this in his video, um, Relativity, Einstein Wrong is the name of the video, where he interviewed a guy at SLAC, S, at Slack, I guess is the way we can say it without going through it, that um, relativity mass increase was not involved in the accelerator. And um, I may be misinterpreting or misrepeating what he said, but he said this on numerous occasions, been saying this constantly. And um, so one of the things I wanna do is, is look into this. So um, the real issue had to do with what is this slack what are they doing? We knew we knew it was a linear accelerator, uh, two miles long. And I mentioned briefly that uh, when Dennis contacted uh, them to get um, design information, um, he sort of brought me into the picture for some help because he wasn't able to come up with much of anything. Well, I had this idea that um, what. Uh, what I remembered from reading in the past that it's a lineac, okay, mm. that, that the name of the, that the design is a lineac design, linear accelerator, okay. So by going to Wikipedia, I looked up lineac. So this is what, this is where, this is where I started making progress. Linear particle accelerator, yep. Wikipedia. Okay, here's the, here's the key. That uh, to answer your question. So I started, um, so when I got <clears> to here, okay, it starts talking about what a lineac is. Now, what a lineac is, is it's essentially a copper tube that's a vacuum with a slow wave structure in it, uh, slow wave structure. And uh, that's the key. Now, here's uh, this uh, picture here on the right hand side shows. Um, I don't think this is really correct, this picture, but it gives you the idea that as the beam is traveling along, it passes through these resonators, okay? But this is really just a schematic idea. So what, what is happening is that the electron beam is passing through a series of microwave resonators. And here's another version of it too. But you don't really see the resonator, you know, it just shows you that the, the resonators are just like uh, tubes. <coughs> and then you see here in the animation that it shows the fields acting in the forward and reverse direction. And that basically is to uh, tell you that the electron beam gets bunched up. Okay, and that's kind of an important idea. Okay, and then you have focusing, which is because the beam becomes defocused in the, um, uh, what they call the transverse direction. So you, the beam um, is designed to capture the photon, the electrons as it moves down the accelerator tube, which in the case of Leniac is two miles long. Okay. Now, to, now here's, you see this animation here? There are two uh, principles. One of them is a standing wave. It's when you have two waves going in opposite directions on the same frequent, on the same transmission line or the same piece of wave guide. And what it does is it creates this standing wave of voltage and current. And in a, um, in the linear tube or in microwave tubes, this standing wave doesn't exist. You have a traveling wave. And what the traveling wave does is it captures the electrons. You see here, it shows the electrons bunched up as it moves along and it, and it captures the electrons and moves them along as, the, uh, as they travel down the accelerator tube. And so basically the electric field that's created in this capture zone, it experiences an electric field, but the electric field is moving, okay, because it's a traveling wave. 
And so uh, Dennis talks about it as like a surfer. Okay, so we talk, we might use the you know, abusive language that the electrons are surfing on the traveling wave as it goes down the, down the tube. <clears throat> and of course, down here at the bottom, if you're interested in going to this um, uh, linear accelerator page, down here is where I find, found some of the, they refer to the Stanford because it's two miles long and it's kind of the granddaddy of linear accelerators. And so what I did was I, man, I, I poked around and visited a number of these. Some of these are irrelevant references, but I was able to, to um, essentially um, discover that at Stanford, at the um, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, they actually did have a repository of uh, tech papers or tech bulletins or whatever you want to call them, where they described how the, the, the technical details of how this thing works. Okay, so uh, I think I've hit these points here. Um, the lineac is a traveling wave structure. And the important point here is, and this is going to become important, the wave velocity is synchronized with the electrons. So the, what's actually causing the electrons to accelerate isn't moving at the speed of light relative to the electrons. It's moving slowly relative to the electrons and pulling them along. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah. All right. Now, I discovered something very, here's my book, okay? Microwave Electronics by John C. Slater. Okay, this is 1950. You have to look up in the uh, in, in my uh, window here if you want to see this. Microwave electronics. Um, yeah, here it is. Turns out I had this book, and I um, Stanford. The the whole business, the point of this technology goes back to the fact that the um, People who are involved in inventing the Klystron, uh, the Varian brothers, were apparently at Stanford. And so there's this cross uh, between electrical engineering and physics in that the technology to build Klystrons, the, the electrical engineering technology of microwave electronics basically was adapted to build this linear accelerator. And so um, you have klystrons, which are providing the RF energy to the slow wave structure, which essentially provides the energy to the electrons as they move down the, um, the slow wave structure. And we said, I talked about this, the electrons can be said to surf on the traveling wave. And this book by John Slater discusses all that. And the reason I brought this up is because surprisingly enough, he has a whole section where he describes all this and discusses all this. He's got the theory of this linear accelerator in this book. Um, and he discusses klystrons and magnetrons and um, gives the theory of the, of the uh, linear accelerator. And that's in chapter 11 very interesting where he describes how, um, you know, the, and when I had been working on this, I kind of realized this without actually reading this book yet, but essentially there are two, what, two processes that you can take advantage of. One is you can take advantage of the fact that if you um, induce a RF signal into the cavity structure, then it can be amplified by the electron beam. So you can make a power microwave power amplifier. So essentially the electron beam gives power to the RF signal as it travels um, down the um, slow wave structure. In a klystron, um, there's uh, not very many cavities. Um, I think five cavities is about the maximum that they have. 
Then there's the other side, you can turn it around and you can inject RF energy and the RF energy that's applied to the slow wave structure can be used to increase the energy of the electron beam. So there are reciprocal processes. So this is really basic. That's why uh, in uh, microwave electronics, um, you know, essentially his, the theory and how this all works is really based on the theory of klystrons. And then you also have traveling wave tubes. You also have magnetrons. And uh, he also talks about, in this book, he talks about the cyclotron, which is another uh, accelerator. So this technology basically comes from electrical engineering. Now, here's the thing. What is the frame of the electron? What's the frame of the electron? Is it relative to the Earth? Or is it relative to the traveling wave? Well, if the electron is in the frame of the traveling wave, it's not moving very fast, so it can't have any mass increase. Well, and it, does everybody agree with that? <laughs> I'm not sure about that, uh, Harry. Well, if you go with the theory of relativity, the theory of relativity talks about the proper mass, uh, yeah. uh, the proper mass, and the proper mass is defined in the frame at which it is at rest. So since an electron is moving in the frame of the traveling wave, its rest frame is essentially moving relative to the uh, frame of the laboratory. <laughs> and in that frame, its mass is equal to its proper mass, which is M0. So, so how is it gaining mass in that frame? Well, can't, Don't, doesn't look to me like it can. So that kind of leads you to the question of, uh, you know, is relativity actually being used? Um, don't think so. Okay, here's another issue that goes to what uh, David to Holster was talking about. Most of the acceleration occurs not in, the, not in the accelerator, but in the injector. So what happens is that the mass increase, if there is a mass increase of an electron, doesn't occur in the linear accelerator, accelerator portion. It occurs in, during the injection process because the electrons have this very low mass and it's very easy to get them up to close to the speed of light with um, not much trouble at all. It's to get to these extra GEVs. Now apparently you can get to a million um, electron volts pretty easily, uh, but to get to the, into the GEV range and, and uh, higher, um, you need the, the accelerator. Okay, and the Stanford accelerator is, I believe, 12 GeV, which in, uh, not 20 GeV, which is, you know, apparently pretty high. The other thing is that it's a pulsed, uh, pulse beam device. It's not on continuously. Um, and that, and the one that we have here in Newport News, which is called the CBAF, that it stands for Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility. So it's not a pulsed accelerator. It's, they're using a continuous flow of electrons, if I understand that correctly. Okay. Um, so one could say that um, David DeHilster um, basically what he said. My understanding of what he's saying is there's no mass increase in the Stanford linear accelerator. And yeah, that could be true because there really isn't much, if any. And I think Dennis uh, has the numbers on that and talk about that. It's a, uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, how well, much. Well, uh, the, the thing is, uh, the, if the electrons are surfing on the traveling wave, 
and they're almost to the speed of light, say uh, 0.79 was a figure I was given. Right. The, the, now you have to. The, 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 the standing wave has to travel at that, or the moving wave has to, the traveling right. wave has to travel at 0 0.79 C2, where C is the velocity of light. Right. Now, I want to make a point here. The reason it's called a slow wave structure is because it slows down the waves. So they're not traveling at the speed of light. Okay. And um, Nearly. It, the whole idea of the slow wave structure is that it slows down the wave so that it can, it can go at the velocity of the electron. Uh, I'm more talking about a traveling wave tube. So in the traveling wave tube, you have a slow wave structure, which is originally was a helix. And what the, and the idea of it is, is that if you have a helix, the wave on the helix is slowed down by the helix because it's going in a helix. So the linear velocity of the wave is slowed down by the fact of the, it's going around on the helix. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so what you do is you slow down the wave to the velocity of, of the electrons. So you get a resonance of the velocity of the wave and the velocity of the electrons. Now, that's what happens in, in, um, in, a, in the amplifier case. And what happens in that case is that the beam gives energy to the waves and the slow wave structure. So that's makes it into a microwave amplifier. And in the case of the uh, linear accelerator, we reverse that and we and power is injected into the slow wave structure and the beam, the electrons in the beam gain energy from the RF waves that are traveling down the slow wave structure. And um, so it's not going at the velocity of light, it's going less than the velocity of light. And that's kind of important to understand. Okay, so here's my list of surprises. Funny, you know, things I wasn't expecting to find. The first one was that uh, the SLAC doesn't exist anymore. The original um, uh, accelerator was apparently dismantled several years ago and they've upgraded it. And that may be why, um, you know, when we were talking to them and asking them for information, they basically didn't really know what to, where to point us to or anything. And, um, but I was kind of surprised by that. Um, then the other surprise I already mentioned was that uh, the technology involved is based on microwave electronics, which is pretty easy for somebody who has an engineering background in microwave electronics to, uh, to basically understand what's going on. And uh, the slow wave structure, I talked about the slow wave structure. Now, I was actually kind of surprised because I thought, you know, that uh, somehow or another that there wasn't anything in this tube. It was just an empty tube, but that's not the case. It's full of these cavities as you go along. And they build the, they built this in 10 foot sections. So you build these, a 10 foot section of cavities, and then they would um, essentially like Lego blocks, you know, put these 10 foot sections in and basically build up the accelerator over time you know, they'd start off with a, you know, a half mile um, accelerator and then, you know, keep adding to it. And eventually they get up to two miles. Okay, I've mentioned the business of the frame of reference is, um, it, what, what's the frame of reference? Are we talking about the earth frame or the frame of the traveling, of the slow wave or the traveling wave? Which, which frame of reference are we going to talk about? Well, I couldn't find anywhere, anywhere, you know, where they actually did any calculations, um, you know, that where relativity actually came in to be a major factor in, in the design. So, you know, I, that's kind of one of the issues that I, that I was looking for. What I was looking for was how do you take special relativity into account when you design uh, this partic particle accelerator? And I was always under the impression that relativity was important and 
and particle accelerators every day prove that relativity was correct. You know, I don't know if you other people have heard that, but I've heard that. And um, I couldn't find anything. Now, you know, in working on this for three or four days and poking around, you know, that doesn't prove that, you know, it's not there, it's not true, but, um, you know, I didn't run across it in, um, in my investigation. Harry, let me make a comment on that. Um, in special relativity, the analysis that mass increase, they use the um, frame of reference as either the Earth or the, or the accelerator ex itself, which is sitting on the surface of the Earth. And, and the problem really is, as you kind of alluded to earlier, that relativity is supposed to um, be valid no matter what which inertial frame you're using. So if you're using an inertial frame that's uh, near the speed of light, um, then you'd come to the opposite conclusion that uh, the electron hasn't gained any weight because it's at rest with respect to that, or nearly at rest with respect to that high velocity inertial frame. And special relativity all also says that um, all inertial frames views are equally valid. So here we have two contradictory conclusions uh, from special relativity. And I think that's really the, the problem uh, that's being alluded to by, by uh, Dr. Michael Kelsey from Slack who was quoted in um, uh, De Hilster's Einstein Wrong movie. Uh, for one thing, but, um, he didn't say this on camera, but he was quoted as saying, um, the first thing we have to do is unteach special relativity to our PhD candidates who are working on the uh, slack. Um, well, and I'm, I'm extending that to to say, to understand what's going on physically, because if you use special relativity, you're gonna get two contradictory physical models of what's going on, and and they're supposed to be equally valid. So well, I think the that's point I'm something to keep in is, mind. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that, um, yeah, I was looking for that, but I really couldn't find anything um, you know, to support that. Uh, one way or the other, it, it just, you know, I just couldn't find anything to, to make that argument um, uh, conclusive or, or um, yeah. concrete. And from what, I've, from what I've read, when they talk about relativity is proved by um, uh, accelerators, both linear and circular, is that they're always using velocity with respect to the, either the accelerator frame or the ECI frame. In, in CNPS, they use the ECI frame. Right. Well, I'm going to talk about this a bit more here as we move along. So you've sort of jumped ahead a little bit. Um, the, um, all right. Um, so uh, we, we mentioned this bullet. Nick talked about this. Um, I could understand why you would say you'd have to unlearn relativity because, you know, the the um, the electrons when they're being accelerated, they're being accelerated in in their uh, in a rest frame that's moving relatively slowly relative to um, to them. They're basically captured by the wave as it moves along. If um, if I were if we're understanding the uh, what's actually happening, so in that frame, they're the proper mass it's, is uh, the rest mass of the electron. So there'd be no mass increase. And, um, you know, that seems pretty clear to me um, <coughs> based on the fact that's how it works. But the last issue is, um, does the mass increase or does the force decrease? Okay, now that goes to, and here we're gonna, um, 
Dennis sent me this paper by this fellow, what's his name, Abdullah or something like that? Musa Abdullah. Yes. Um, and he sort of goes with this idea that the mass isn't increasing, the force is decreasing. That's uh, his explanation of this of this relativistic effect, which I've always sort of felt was really basically more more akin to what's going on. The whole idea of the mass increase, if you read what people say about it, the canonical view, I would say, of the relativist is that this is their justification for saying that the speed of light is a um, absolute limit that can't be exceeded because the mass increases to infinity. And so it's pretty obvious that you can't, um, you know, accelerate an object um, past, you know, if its mass is infinity, you can't cause it to increase its velocity. And so therefore the uh, speed of light is an absolute limit. So that's pretty much what the, you know, the standard, um, uh, explanation is it's given in the physics books. But um, this guy, uh, uh, Abdullah, apparently objects to that. And uh, he's written a number of papers on this, which is kind of interesting. Uh, this is the paper that um, Dennis sent me and wanted me to look at. And um, I think Dennis tried to reproduce his results. Um, and uh, you did a, sent me some information on that. Um, the, I don't think this is actually is interesting. What I did was I started poking around and I discovered that he has a whole series of papers at the General Science Journal. And his idea, he talks, if we get down here to his conclusions, I, I sort of uh, uh, jumped the shark a little bit. I thought his conclusions were kind of interesting down here at the bottom where he talks about um, and um, essentially he's saying that there really isn't any mass increase. Um, he says, import for relativistic mass is not a physical quantity, but the ratio of, uh, of electrostatic force to acceleration. And um, he says, this ratio becomes infin infinitely large for motion in a straight line without any problem of infinite masses at the speed of light. So he's essentially come up with a, he's a, trying to come up with a theory that doesn't get this uh, infinite mass at the speed of light. And then he says, Lorentz factor has nothing to do with physical mass. And uh, if you wanna read this, um, this, sort of was a teaser for me. And um, I found another paper, which I like better to, that gets to this point. So I'm gonna see if I can't bring that up. On the energy and mass of electric charges in a body. Okay. Now, uh, he sort of goes into it here where he talks about this in his introduction. And um, this is more in my mind, um, a, a clearer statement of his thesis of uh, that this equation here is the mass increase is not what's happening. It's a change in the electric electrical force. So um, I, if you're interested, anybody, you know, those of you out there are interested in this thesis of of uh, that's the force that changes, the action of the force that changes and not the mass of the body. Um, he's, this author here, it's, he's at the GSJ, has um, basically developed this thesis, um, um, put out a bunch of papers on it. Um, so I guess that's about all I have to say here on this subject. I'd like to go back to what I was trying to say earlier in reference to what Harry was saying. There are two topics that are mutually exclusive. What does special relativity say is happening and what is happening physically? Because special relativity is observer-centric. 
and well, it I has confi totally conflicting models of what's happening physically, depending upon what frame you're looking at. Right. So, now, my point was, um, I understand exactly what you're saying. The, the issue is, how, how, would, how would you, in the case of this issue of mass increase, uh, where, how could you find some uh, basic, how, how can you find some concrete experimental data? And that's kind of what I was looking for that would support your contention, Nick. And it's kind of a little bit early to say that. I really didn't run across anything that would really, you know, upset the apple cart, so to speak, in my cursory um, search. You know, it wasn't, you know, it's only three days of poking around. Um, but there wasn't anything that really hit me, um, you know, where they actually produced any proof that mass increased with velocity in their, in the Stanford linear accelerator, which was the only one that I even did any poking around in. So I would say that at this point, it's all just preliminary. Well, in effect, they, when they analyze the data, they are using a preferred frame version of special relativity. And they use the rest frame and the accelerator to do their calculations. And like when you have an accelerated particle hit a rest particle and you produce a new particle, you have come up even in the rest frame of the accelerator, more mass than what you started with, uh, unless you say somehow uh, ma mass was increased by the fact that the accelerated particle was moving quickly. But even within the context of special relativity, you can come to that conclusion by saying that um, kinetic energy has increased. You don't have to say the mass of the particle is increased, just the kinetic energy has increased. And then there's the conservation of mass energy, even when you create uh, new mass in a collision. Well, the purpose of our discussion here is to basically, you know, critique. And we're basically trying to understand what's happening. <laughs> That's my view of it. Yeah. Uh, but I still think that I think I still think the conclusion, you know, there's not really that much mass increase, okay, as it goes down this accelerator, and plus, you can't you can't really expect there to be a lot of mass increase. I mean, and, and the electron is being acted on by the electric field that's in the frame, so the electron is basically moving slowly if at all relative to the to the field so it sees the electric field is basically a static electric field that's causing it to um, accelerate down the tube so there's no relativistic effects in the frame of the of the uh, of the traveling wave well the traveling wave speeds up as it goes down the line because they Vary the diameter of the tube to uh, control. Right, you would expect that to be, well, they have it in 10, 10 foot segments. So as you go down, the velocity of the wave would change as you go down the, down, down through the uh, uh, accelerator. So they change the characteristics of the slow wave structure so that the wave is moving faster as you go along. Yeah, neither the Italian mechanics, uh, predicts uh, essentially zero uh, mass gain as you go down the line from uh, starting at velocity 0 0.90 C and going to uh, velocity 0 0.792 C, then uh, there'll be essentially zero mass gain, I think. Although, of course, I have to redo all these numbers now. Well, uh, now we get, I'm sorry for, um, I wanted to make the point that uh, the gentleman that we were referring to earlier, the paper that I saw, one of his points was he claims that that the mass increase isn't really credible because 
when it hit the target, it would cause much more of an impact than is actually observed. And I read that and I thought, is that really true? I mean, wouldn't we know that? Wouldn't the, I mean, that seems to me kind of an obvious thing yeah. that you could look for. And um, so I, I wasn't really quite sure how to react to that statement. You know, his claim was essentially that a particle is met. So we're talking about particles that are traveling almost at the speed of light. So their mass is almost infinite. That's his argument, basically. So they're traveling so close to the speed of light that their mass is almost, for all practical purposes, nearly infinite, <laughs> which seems kind of strange. Yeah, the, uh, the nowadays we do things like they have anti-electrons, uh, positrons, crashing in, coming the other direction around, they also at almost at the speed of light, and then they collide them. Right, and you'd think, you know, you've got two objects traveling at, you know, God knows, almost the speed of light, so the mass should be tremendous, and, you know, you'd think you'd get more mass I, I, I don't know what to think of that without really, you know, yeah, having you some... To do, you have to do the numbers to do it like that. Well, yeah, he didn't really present any numbers. He just made... I'm kind of inclined to the view that um, the reason you can't go faster than the speed of light is not because of the mass increase. It's because you can't, you can't get the force, um, you know, you, you have to be, in the case of an accelerator as as Harvey points out here in his comment in the chat, the, the force that's accelerating has to be moving at less than the speed of light because it's electromagnetic. So you can never really get anything. You, in order to accelerate something faster than the speed of light, you have to have something faster than the speed of light to begin with to cause it to happen. Well, if you, have, if you agree that there is such a thing as inertia propulsion, that would do it because you just uh, to, uh, using a force thr thrust from within rather than electromagnetic forces. Yes, but wouldn't that involve some kind of electromagnetic force to activate it? Uh, if you assume, as I do, that Poincare was right and all, ma all physics is basically boils down to electromagnetism. Then you'd have to say yes, but uh, the, as uh, Musa points out in his article, uh, he has some diagrams uh, on page uh, six. Uh, the uh, electric magnetic forces tend to cancel out if you just have matter that's not charged or anything, or not magnetized. It, even though the particles themselves are electromagnetic, the, the, the fact that there's no net charge and there's no magnetism essentially means that uh, you don't have to worry about things like, uh, uh, you know, gaining uh, inertial mass because of uh, being propelled along by electromagnetic field, for example. To me, the mass never increases. What you have is mass times velocity input and mass times velocity output. So I think, I mean, it's my understanding and I'm not an expert in this field. So it's just my basic idea that they can only measure voltage and current impact depth of something, you know, like they can look at a slab of something and see how far something went in and measure the properties of the average density and you know how much energy went in so they got energy input equals energy output so there is no mass increase but the field itself has a limitation because they're always going perpendicular to the field right no or they're going or or that's for the magnetic that's the magnetic field they have a velocity of a charged particle so it, you know, does like that, and they keep going in a circle, and then boom, when they the, hit stuff. When the electrons go through the cavities, it's my understanding that the field is, is longitudinal. So 
it's the voltage. electrons when they pass through the cavities they're passing in the direction of the electric field so the electric yes. field accelerates them yeah that's the line act i was referring to the the okay got it so the there's a guy named his name is rune z cowell c-a-o he's a person who has written like surpassing the speed of light and in the paper i'm looking at right now basically what he says is if you could uh why can sailboats they've got ultra fine sailboats that uh you know they're like faster have, than the wind they're faster than the wind and so he uses that as an analogy that if you were to so you have this a linear field okay i'm, I'm facing the mirror and the camera <laughs> You have this linear field and the voltage potential causes the charged particle to accelerate, okay? He says that if you could bring it in from an angle, the field is this way, that it would see the cross section of the field and the vectors would add. So it has a velocity component in this way. The field has a com velocity component in this direction and the net result is a longer vector. So the particle would tend to go this way, you know, it would basically reflect and gain energy. And he said, if you could zigzag it over a long distance, uh, and he even calculates and does the calculations for us, then you could actually uh, increase or exceed the speed of light with a calculation. And you don't have to uh, fudge factor mass and stuff like that. He, he's got other videos that are, he has videos and he also has a presentation on relativity, I mean a paper. So I can, I'm, I'm trying to provide links, but I'm kind of slow. I'm listening to y'all trying to look for links and I think he's been censored <laughs> because it's hard to find his stuff. Well, it's not that easy to find the establishment stuff either. <laughs> As I found when I, I was, I wanted, I, I did want to mention that I went to the CBAF um, webpage and uh, I wanted to, to find the, um, what the CBAF looks like. And I wanted to find some technical information on it. I couldn't find it any, and I mean, it's just like, I mean, excuse me, that's your premier instrument. Why isn't that front and center? This is how the thing works. But, you know, being bureaucrats, apparently they didn't think that was important. <laughs> so I don't know, I might find it eventually. But I've actually been to the CBAF site and seen it. And um, it's, you know, it looks pretty much like the pictures that you see of the Stanford lineac. And apparently what this is, is two lineacs. And then you have a curved section. Okay, so it's, uh, they're two linear sections. So it's more of a racetrack type thing than a circular machine. Well, I think if you're, trying to find out what's happening physically, you have to put special relativity aside. Well, and I think you have, have to, to say put this, there is aside. a single <laughs> preferred frame and its velocity with respect to that physical frame or even better than that velocity with respect to a preferred physical entity like an ether or a gravitational field or something like that. And well, I think, that's I think the we context. understand that. Um, I think we agree on that. I don't think there. I don't. I don't know. If there's anybody disagreeing here with respect to that. Well, you talked about um, proper mass. Um, with respect to, I don't think that that wave is the is the single preferred frame for what's going on. So, well, yeah, you can argue, you can argue about that. Yeah, but my point in bringing that up is, is that that um, you could perceive, you could say that's the frame of the electron, and you could argue from that point of view, and then the electron doesn't gain any mass in that frame. So, yeah, but I think sure. that thinking is relativistic. You're talking, you're just talking about these various different frames, where I think you have to say, all right, here is the preferred frame for this phenomenon. And here's the absolute velocity 
and therefore the absolute kinetic energy or absolute uh, gravitational potential energy. Nick, Nick, I had some comments in chat uh, along the lines of uh, what you just uh, uh, discussed, I mean, kind of uh, suggested regarding the, the ether and so on. Could you please just look, have a look at it? Okay, I have, to, I have to bring up chat. Actually, I interacted with Did Harry. You say, were you saying that was that I was saying something similar to your... Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, actually, I, I gave the comment that actually could come as a kind of answer or support in, of your of you, of you, uh, comment. Yeah, I'm sorry. My point, Nick, was I didn't really, and, and I can't say that I... My objective in doing this was to find where they did the calculation, okay, based on the lab frame being the rest frame. Right. They did the calculations based on that, and that, and they had to take special relativity into effect in doing those calculations, okay? I didn't but, find but, any but, such, my point, here's my point, Nick. My point is, I didn't find any such calculations. But that doesn't say that they don't exist. I didn't find any such calculations or any such considerations at all when I looked at this. And what I discovered was that the design principle had nothing to do with special relativity. It was based on microwave electronics and microwave amplifier tubes, glystrons, and that had nothing to do with special relativity. So the principle of operation doesn't seem to be in any way, shape, or form involving special relativity. Well, uh, in, yeah, I'm uh, not sure that's true of um, uh, circular accelerators, where the, you know, it's we didn't look use. at circular accelerators. We're only looking at the, that was yeah. one of the points was that looking at the linear accelerator yeah. uh, point of view. Now, you know, obviously I could look at other types of accelerators and, you know, and, and we could do that. I'm just saying at this stage with the preliminary investigation, there wasn't any obvious um, claim of special relativity being involved in the design of the accelerator, which would tend to be consistent with what um, the quote that you uh, made from the guy, I can't, what was his name, the Stanford? Michael uh, Kelsey. Right. We have to unlearn special relativity. Right. Um, so but I, I'm just saying that I couldn't find anything where special relativity was a an important design factor in the design of, of the machine. Um, now, well, uh, that's pretty much limited by the fact that what we could find wasn't wasn't very much. Okay, uh, guys, Danny, could you please allow me just one minute? Because well, you know, I, I don't know how to do chat here. Somebody uh, would, would bother looking at the comment and I would want it to uh, convey it in one or two sentences, okay? Will it be okay? Okay. You know, point is, my point is that in this experiment, the electrons were essentially confined, were encapsulated, you know, and there were no, there was no interaction of electrons with the ether. Otherwise, in other situations, as as for example those uh, uh, circular accelerators the electrons would be exposed to the ether and, that, and then there would be the uh, fluid dynamical effects of increase of, of, of frontal pressure. So that would be the reason why electrons would not be uh, 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 able to accelerate. Of course, nothing has to do with the special theory of relativity because it's, it is on itself totally irrelevant. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um... Uh, uh, you know, uh, in regard to what this question, whether a uh, mass increase has anything to do with special relativity, I think they argue as follows. For example, if you have an a, a electromagnet, the, the electrons move very slowly, the drift velocity is slow. But, uh, but if you transfer to the, to the electrons moving at this drift velocity, then you, the electrons are no longer moving in this new frame. 
uh, uh, but the uh, time uh, is changing and uh, distance is changing. And according to the Lorentz transform, which the SRT is hijacked. And uh, so uh, we have electrons in the new frame not even moving, but yet uh, the magnetic field is predicted as the same. Uh, and, you know, depending on which they, you can compute it for either the two frames, the electron moving or the, uh, the, the fixed frame or the electron moving frame. So uh, by the same token, the, uh, the mass increase uh, uh, can be, uh, since uh, Column's law is, uh, you have to go relativistic with Column's law, you divide by gamma, not multiply. But otherwise, gamma comes in just the same. And uh, so you could say, well, the charges, instead of saying mass is increased, you could say the charge, the moving charge is decreasing. And you still get the same result. So uh, all this basically comes out of the, uh, the Lorentz transform. Even though the electrons are not moving in the moving frame, the uh, electrons- Yeah, but you're talking about the Einsteinian version of the Lorentz transform and the, the model that it's consistent with. We're trying to find out a physical explanation. Yeah, there, to there do is that, none, you, can't none, be, you can't be discussing different frames where yeah, I know it's high speed in one frame and zero speed in another frame. Yeah, I know, but I was trying to get at uh, uh, Harry, uh, Harry's point that he couldn't see where this SRT came in. I think it comes in in that kind of thinking, which I outlined, which I do not endorse, though, which I just okay. outlined. Uh, and... Uh, 